Hello there. <laughs> I'm Christy Erickson, and welcome to my office. Uh, today, we're going to learn a little bit about ladies boxing in St. Joseph County, while you join me for Tales from History. So the history of women's boxing actually goes all the way back to Victorian times, when the vogue was for women to uh, join some athletic pursuits such as golf or tennis and boxing was one of those things that some women enjoyed to do Though it wasn't recommended for them to be quite as brutal as men or uh, in many places It wasn't allowed for women to actually fight each other. They could only uh, Box with punching bags or things like that, but it was uh, not so much recommended for Thin women, but more for overweight women because they could stand up to the rigors of something like boxing I guess. So uh, fast forward to World War II when a lot of women joined the factories and, and worked on um, in places like the Studebaker factory or the Oliver factory and uh, after the war it became very popular for women to be much more domestic. You know, they returned to the home. You saw a lot of popular culture like June Cleaver and Leave it to Beaver where there was the domestic goddess um, because people kind of wanted to get back to normal after the war. But there were a lot of women who didn't want to get back to normal. And you saw a lot of women's sports start in the time after World War II, such as the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League or uh, women's boxing in the case of what we're talking about today. And as it turns out, St. Joseph County in South Bend was a hub of women's boxing. And that was all started by a promoter named Johnny Nate. And Johnny Nate uh, was promoting men's boxing, um, which was a little more standard at the time, but he decided to get into women's boxing as well and actually went around town and recruited a lot of women. Um, some of them he just walked up to and said, hey, do you wanna be a boxer? And got a few of those to come train in his gym. And he started having matches between women in the area and eventually all over the Midwest. But what happened was that in a lot of places, if people saw that there were two women on the ticket, uh, the match would be canceled because um, they thought it was uh, a bad idea. They thought it was against all standards of decency and... Um, so a lot of the women that boxed for Johnny Nate actually boxed under assumed names that were more masculine so people wouldn't find out that they were women until they actually came to the match and saw them. So during these fights, these women actually didn't wear much protective equipment. Uh, they didn't have any mouth guards or head guards, but they did have to wear a rubber-like breast protector and also had to face a lot of rampant sexism from people around them. They were told that no one would ever want to marry a woman who was able to knock her husband out, or they were told that women were better off inside sweaters than inside the ring, or uh, you'd see articles about how, boy, these women can clout just as well as they can cook, which I'm sure is not what they were most concerned about. But uh, Johnny Nate kind of took a cue from uh, other groups of women athletes like the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and started promoting his boxers' femininity and asked them to wear dresses for their public appearances or go on national TV to promote boxing in the area um, because... At those times, at least, you, uh, for a lot of these women, in order to have legitimacy in their sport, which they obviously excelled at, they also had to prove their femininity as well, um, which, you know, men didn't have to do, but those were the times, of course. So uh, let's talk about some of those women. So one of those very early uh, boxers in the late 1940s was actually a British woman named Barbara Buttrick, and uh, she got her start in the UK, uh, where she was called the Battling Butt. And she was four foot eleven, and she was a typist, and would fight anyone her size uh, who wanted to fight her. And she eventually came to the United States because of a kind of rampant anti-female boxing. Um, group that was working against her there so came to the u.s to fight some of the women here and in the u.s uh changed her nickname to the mighty adam which seems like a very you know post-world war ii popular name uh, i assume due to her small size barbara buttrick only ever lost once uh to joanne hagan 
and uh, Joanne Hagen was actually about eight inches taller and 33 pounds heavier than her. So she must have been a very fierce fighter. And uh, later in life, um, Barbara Buttrick actually was very involved in the boxing world. She appeared in a Nike ad. She worked for the um, International Boxing Federation and, and things like that. So promoted female boxing her entire life. So next up, we have a Mishawaka woman whose name was Arvilla Emrick, and I mentioned a little bit ago that a lot of these women boxed under more masculine names, and Ms. Emrick uh, boxed under Pat, so Pat Emrick was her name. And she was a ticket seller, was recruited by Johnny Nate, and uh, did a lot of training in the area, ran around um, the train tracks by her house and around Notre Dame, and ended up uh, wearing shorts the color of Notre Dame blue and gold for her initial matches. So Pat Emmerich accepted uh, Johnny Nate's offer, thinking that any girl who grows up in a family with five brothers should be able to defend herself against a member of her own fair sex, uh, is a quote from her. And she worked during her training from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. at a local bakery to make additional money, so a busy lady. Her first fight was her only loss in 1949 at the Palais Royale. Um, and she fought a woman named Helen Lant, and she went undefeated after that. Pat Emmerich also told a story about fighting a young lady uh, on whom the referee was a little bit sweet. Uh, she also said the lady was friendly with the referee. And the lady was biting. She bit her during the match several times. She said she had the lipstick marks on her blouse to prove it. Uh, but ringside officials was onto that and eventually awarded Pat the match. Um, Pat Emmerich also defeated Joanne Hagen in 1949 for the championship uh, in Council Bluffs and four rounds on a TKO. And for that match, she was awarded 250 whole dollars. So uh, Pat Emmerich's career in boxing was cut short when she was hit head on in an automobile crash in 1950 in Michigan City and left in a coma with and had to have pins put in her knee, meaning she couldn't bend her knee anymore, uh, ending her boxing career. But she later moved to Tennessee and had 10 kids and uh, always said that she enjoyed her career and loved the rest of her life. Uh, next up on our list is a woman named Phyllis Kugler, and Phyllis boxed under the name Phil, again, so people would think she was a man until they got to the ring. And for Phyllis in particular, uh, it is hard to mistake her for a man. Phyllis Kugler was uh, one of the more famous boxers in the U.S. and was chosen along with Joanne Hagen by their promoter to do those promotional events to promote that uh, femininity of the boxers. Phyllis Kugler and Joanne Hagen uh, both appeared on the Steve Allen Show, and because, of course, it's important for athletic women to show their femininity, at least at the time, they were made to appear in ball gowns and uh, actually change behind a screen and come back out and spar to promote their upcoming championship match in 1956. Um, and uh, that was actually decided uh, in a decision uh, toward Phyllis Kugler, um, which was a little bit controversial at the time. In 1957, she fought Barbara Buttrick in San Antonio, and on that same night, she was awarded by the FOP as the Woman Boxer and uh, Beauty Queen of the Year. But uh, unfortunately, she lost to Barbara Buttrick at the time and also lost that championship title um, to the Mighty Adam. Uh, Phyllis Kugler lived in South Bend, the rest of her life until 2014 when she passed away. She worked as a psychiatric counselor. Uh, she worked as an advocate for rape victims and also owned a consignment boutique and was obviously very proud of her boxing career um, until uh, she passed away. And last but not least, uh, we'll talk about Joanne Hagen. Um, Hagen was one of Johnny Nate's most famous boxers, and she was the champion for several years and many times. Uh, Joanne Hagen went to Washington High School where her favorite sport was football, and she actually tried to join the football team, but was denied by the coach. Uh, so she joined the band instead and played the horn um, as part of the marching band. She later worked at Bendix, and when one of the other employees uh, tried to get a little fresh with her, she punched him, uh, which was seen by Johnny Nate's brother and let him know that there's this woman at the Bendix factory who can really throw a punch. So Nate approached her and asked her to join his uh, boxing league, which uh, as it turned out, she did. 
So Joanne Hagen uh, trained with Johnny Nate, um, fought in several championships. She won the title first in West Virginia in 1950, which was tried, uh, the athletic commission in West Virginia tried to cancel the match, uh, like I said, in the name of common decency, as one of the commissioners said. But one of the other commissioners actually had a ringside seat, so uh, the match went on and uh, was attended by, I believe, 4,000 people, so very popular. Joanne Hagen won 75 matches. She went on tour, like I mentioned before, with Phyllis Kugler. Uh, they appeared on the Steve Allen show with the ball gowns. She also appeared on What's My Line. Kugler was supposed to appear on What's My Line as well, but they only had time for one of them. So since Hagen was a champion, uh, Kugler unfortunately got cut. And we have some footage uh, from that to show you as well. Joe and Hagen, is that right? <laughs> Miss Joanne Hagen, where are you from? South Bend, Indiana. South Bend, Indiana. Well, that's nice to have you here. We know have some friends out that way. Would you meet the panel? Just say hello and then come on over here with me. Actually, if Jerry Mahori wasn't over there, I'd probably let you go over and say, you know, but you don't know what's going to happen when you've got him <laughs> around. So uh, I'll just ask, you know how we score things? Yes. Fine, then let's let folks at home and our friends here know exactly what your line is. <laughs> Panel, I will tell you that Miss Hagen is self-employed, and uh, let's begin with Arlene Francis. All right, with you, Jerry? Yes, if I can ask a question or two later. All right. Mm. After a while. Miss Hagen, uh, do you deal in services? Yes. Uh, do you have to have training in your job? Yes. Is it uh, formal training? Do you have to be a college graduate? No. One down and nine to go, Mr. Winchell. Uh, would it be all right if Jerry asks these questions? Sure, Paul. As long as I'm here, I figure. You know, is it all right? Yeah, you go ahead. All right, uh, he'll, he'll speak for me. Fine. That's a switch. I'll speak for him. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Uh, well, tell me, uh, are these services, are they for men and for women? Yes. Oh, I got a yes, I got a yes. Did you you always do, I heard. Uh, I beg your pardon? I said I heard you <laughs> always got a yes. Oh, thank you, dear. It's all right. Hey, hey, huh? <laughs> oh, yes, excuse me. Uh, well, are these services, uh, uh, possibly for children, too? Mm? Yes. They are? Children could take advantage of them. <clears throat> I beg your pardon? Say, children could take advantage of these services if they so desire. He's giving me double talk again. No, no, no. <laughs> oh. Could we have a conference, please? <laughs> I wasn't sure. Go ahead. Uh, do you touch these uh, people in any way at all? Yes. You do? <laughs> she does. Could we have a conference, please? No, what? No, come on, come on. <laughs> Just ask the question. Oh, well, uh, do these uh, folks come to you? Yes. They do. Yes, now, let's not misunderstand. There is a laying on of hands possible in the performance of the service, but this does not necessarily mean that the laying on of hands isn't connected with those who come and get some benefit from the service. Oh, well, you do what you like, and I'll do what I like. All right, sir. <laughs> oh, well, uh, let's see. Uh, you work in an office? No. Two down. <laughs> Two down, and there go, Miss Blaine. I somehow have the feeling that there's something, uh, when I use the word athletic connected with what you do, am I uh, using it too loosely? In other words, is there something athletic connected with what you do? Yes. Is it loosely? Uh, <laughs> um, do you teach anything to uh, men and women? No. That's three down and seven to go, Mr. Sir. Miss Hagen, of course, South Bend is famous for Notre Dame University. Have you got any connection at all with Notre Dame? No. Oh, damn it, thank you, Miss Francis. Are you proficient in some particular sports line, Miss Hagen? Yes. Uh, is it one sport more than another? Yes. Is it an outdoor sport? Sometimes. Well, then it isn't golf, because you can't do that indoors. Uh, yeah, do you use any equipment in this sport? Yes. Uh huh. Do you carry anything in your hand? No. Five down and five to go, Mr. Winchell. Me? Yes. Uh, do you wear any kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a special outfit while you're? Yes. You do. Like like uh, uh, some kind of costume. Yes. Yeah. What does it look like? 
Never mind. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, uh, this, uh, she doesn't have anything in her hand when she does this boy. Maybe huh? she does it with her feet? Yeah, maybe she does it. If I Football. ask her, I won't get a yes. You know <laughs> yes, I won't no. get a yes. Yeah, that's a good question. It is? Uh-huh. Do you use your feet? No. Why, you... No, no, no. Right about... <laughs> well, I'm afraid if Miss Hagen will agree, we would have to agree that in performing in a sport, you do put your feet to use. You mean I got a yes? You get a yes. I get a yes! How do you like a yes? All right, all right, go ahead. Uh, do you, uh, do you perform this, uh, like, on uh, part of the team? No. That's six no. down and four to go, Miss Blaine. I'm going to give you one more minute. Um, you don't use the feet, uh... No, that the feet are used as they would... And in other words, you also use the arms. You use the entire body. Yes. Um, I pass. Maybe she makes I really it. pass. Miss Hagen, is what you do done near the water? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> Seven times three died. to go, Miss Francis. Is it a sport uh, that we would read about in the sports columns of the paper? Yes. You'd read about in the sports columns of the paper. I'm really so confused. There's no hands, no feet, and you use some equipment. No, no, what no. is the left? You no did say you used no... equipment. Yeah, we use equipment, but you're confused on hands and feet. We agree that the feet and hands are used. Yes, but does, do the feet ever touch the equipment, whatever it is? <laughs> well, I, by that I mean if it's a high jump I or... quit. I quit. Turn down and no more to go. Professional boxer is Miss Hagen. Oh, no. Boxer. <laughs> Joanne Hagen, uh, whose real name was actually Joanne Verhagen, but uh, shortened it for her boxing name, uh, appeared on What's My Line with the nod from Sidney Pollock, who is uh, another famous South Bend uh, native. He uh, was in the television and movie arts. Uh, which probably many of you have heard of him, and helped move her photo and her letter up the line. And she got the call just three days later to appear on that show. So she also appeared in the first nationally broadcast on the radio uh, boxing match with female boxers when she fought against Barbara Buttrick in 1954. And later that year, uh, her fight against Phyllis Kugler was the first nationally televised boxing match um, in the United States, so uh, a very popular woman. Her last fight uh, occurred here in town at St. Joseph High School, where she fought Phyllis Kugler again for that um, national championship, which they had promoted on the Steve Allen show, and ended in Kugler's victory when she took the title from Hagen. The, it was decided by a, a kind of controversial decision that caused a little bit of friction between the two, and Hagen ended up uh, partnering with Johnny Nate uh, at his gym, training other boxers, um, female boxers, and in some cases, um, younger male boxers. She helped him build uh, a gym at 513 Hill Street and live nearby at 509. She actually laid part of the foundation herself and did some of the cab cabinetry work on the inside since her father was a carpenter and taught her some of those trades and uh, worked in that gym for a few years, even though the Indiana Athletic Commission tried to shut it down uh, in 1957 because uh, they noticed that they were letting young boys, um, teenage boys, fight women as training partners, uh, as well as uh, they were allowing women to be referees uh, during matches with men, which apparently was a no-no, but um, they were unable to shut the gym down. Joanne Hagen joined the Marines later in life, uh, which we have some photos of, and um, again, lived here in the area until 2004 when she passed away as well.